Good evening and welcome to our season's second Six at Six lecture featuring research by NKU's talented faculty along with a couple of exciting guests this season. We are live from the North Media Studio on the campus of NKU. I'd like to welcome our studio audience and our virtual attendees as well. I am Mark Nykirk, the director of the Scripps Howard Center for Civic Engagement here at NKU. We connect campus and community, including with this lecture series. We announced our new season last month, but there was one hole in it that's now been filled, and I think you're going to like this one. Each year we've been fortunate to have a top journalist from the Associated Press, including reporters who have covered presidents, wars, international affairs. This year our speaker will be Peter Pregaman, who directs AP's new climate and environmental team. They've been doing some amazing work and Peter will tell us about that. He'll be with us in March. We're finalizing the date now. One more thing before we start. Next week, the Scripps Center has a special event at the Cincinnati Art Museum. We are hosting a talk by John McClain, author of the beautiful little book, Home Waters, about family, faith, and fishing. You may know the McLean name. His father, Norman McLean, wrote A River Runs Through It, a beloved book in the outdoor writing genre. And if you don't know the book, you may remember that Brad Pitt movie about fly fishing. Uh, our NKU dance students have been creating and choreographing a new dance celebrating the two McLean books. And they will premiere their dance at the Art Museum event before John takes the stage. That will be at 6.15 next Thursday uh, at the Cincinnati Art Museum. You can reserve a seat uh, from the Art Museum site or just email me at engage at nku.edu. Right, uh, now, a word about tonight. Our speaker is Jonathan, uh, Dr. Jonathan Reynolds, our Regents Professor of History and Geography here at NKU. Dr. Reynolds teaches courses in African and World History, Historical Methods, and a course in the honors program, World History Through a Dozen Mills. That one sounds kind of tasty, I think. Uh, he is uh, uh, the recipient of many awards for his research and teaching, including the, in 2014, the Milbourne Outstanding Professor Award here at NKU. Uh, and he is also current president of the World History Association. As you'll see for yourself in just a few moments, Dr. Reynolds is a student uh, favorite at NKU. Uh, why? Because he knows his stuff and he makes it interesting. His topic this evening, a short history of distance, a human story of time, space, power, and privilege. A quick program note, there's a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, those of you who are joining us virtually. Type your questions in there and we'll get to them at uh, the close of the talk. And those of you uh, live with us uh, in person in the studio, just raise your hand and uh, we'll have some interaction at the end. Thank you and Dr. Reynolds, the stage is yours. Hi there folks and welcome to Six at Six. I'm Dr. Jonathan Reynolds, which I think somebody, that somebody being Mark Nykirk, just told you. So I am here to talk to you today about a short history of distance, a human story of time, space, power, and Privilege, I, I, he's probably already told you this too, but I'm a professor of history here at Northern Kentucky University. And I've got a slide to sort of, an image here to sort of frame um, some of what we're gonna be talking about. And this is a most unusual map. We don't see maps like this much anymore. They were once in the 19th century when people were particularly entranced by time. Um, they were fairly common, and this is a British isochronic map of the world, that it is a map of the world which measures not distance, but instead time. So this is, measures time from Europe to other parts of the world. So if you were going from Europe to North Africa, or this region, or maybe even the east coast of the United States, you are about a week away. That's what the little yellow band is. But if you're in the brown zone, you were 40 days away from Europe. Um, a bit of foreshadowing though, this is a very Eurocentric map and it's time from Europe to these places. Um, for many of these places, particularly the places that are brown or blue, the time from there to Europe 
was effectively infinite. It was largely impossible for you to get from those places to Europe, especially if you were a brown person in a brown part of the world. But we'll get to that when we get to the privilege portion of our discussion. So that's just our foreshadowing here. So let me talk about what I call my cunning plan. And I'm gonna talk about all these things in a bit more detail as we go through it. So I'm just gonna introduce them to you right now. First of all, I'm gonna talk about what is distance. It seems simple, but it's not. And that's a good thing, because otherwise this would be a really boring presentation. Um, and, and what does distance do? How, how does distance act as a force on our lives and the lives of other people? Um, also, I'm going to mention, how did I get here? Actually, I'm going to talk about this part now. How did I get to talking about distance? Well, as is so many things in academia, there are books involved. I am just wrapping up a world history textbook, which my former students, even from over a decade ago, will say he's not done with that yet. Um, but the name of that world history textbook is World in Motion, A Dynamic History of Humankind. And the whole textbook is built around the theme of motion. Motion. And once I started thinking really hard about motion, I started thinking really hard about distance. And so the spin-off of the world history textbook built around motion is going to be my next book, which is going to be a book about distance, which not very surprisingly has the exact same title as this presentation. Uh, so that's how I got here. Um, but anyway, the way I'm going to organize this talk is it's kind of like the general outline of the book I'm working on. Uh, it's selected case studies of human beings and our relationship to distance. So I'm going to talk about ancient human migrations. We are going to start out about 100,000 years ago. That'll probably be about 615. Um, and then we're going to move on to the rise of agriculture in cities and how that changes human relationships to distance. Um, then we're going to talk about water and distance, because water has a particular sort of force on distance. I'll give a, give a little bit of it away. Um, water starts out as a multiplier of distance in human history. That is, it's something that increases distance. And over time, it becomes something that divides distance. It shrinks the distance between different parts of the world. Um, then we're going to talk about one of my very favorite concepts, and that is the death of distance. It is the idea that through culture and technology, human beings have overcome distance. We have triumphed over distance. We can jump on a plane and fly to anywhere the heck we want, and we can move things all over the planet with lightning speed. Um, it's more complicated than that, but it's a great topic. We're going to talk about the death of distance. Then we're going to talk, and this is where we really hopefully will get to the meat of this uh, discussion and really talk about distance on our lives and our friends' lives and our fellow human beings' lives today. Uh, we're going to talk about distance, wealth, power, and privilege and how all those things interact in the modern world today um, and work into that how we regulate distance as well as seek to kill it at the same time. Uh, the conclusion, this isn't the real conclusion, but I, I put it in here uh, because I think it's, it's useful. Uh, one way of looking at history is just by looking at it through the changing human relationship with distance. And then we'll I hopefully have some questions. So I've got at least 45 minutes, maybe an hour to talk, and then you can ask a whole bunch of questions. And the more questions you ask, the happier I will be. Whether they are from our immense studio audience here, or, or from all you folks out there in Zoomy land, uh, wherever you might be. Um, by the way, here I got some other stuff. I don't know where this is. It's somewhere in the Pacific. This is one of those little signposts like in the opening scene of MASH or something like that that says distance to other places. Easter Island is 2,065 kilometers that way. And Wellington is 5,333 kilometers that way. That's just a fine, so, fun sort of way that distance from other things is how we sort of define our own location. Um, down here, 
I don't know if we've got any math people out there. Uh, this is the classic way you find the distance between two points on a grid. That's our formula for measuring where X and Y are and how far apart they are. And this is the distance formula, the relation between time, speed, and distance. And they're just fun things to put in there to show that human beings are always interested in distance. At least all you human beings are. That's why you're here. And thank you. 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 All right. Doink. All right. So here we go. Uh, this is where I talk about what the heck is distance. Um, in general, distance is a lot more than physical distance. And uh, geographers, by the way, geographers and economists are the people who typically talk about distance. Uh, interestingly enough, historians don't talk about it much, um, which I'm glad for, because that means there's space for a historical book that talks about distance. Um, but the most basic kind of distance is what we call absolute distance. And that's what we measure in miles. So New York is however many hundreds of miles from Cincinnati, and that's its absolute distance. Um, but typically, when you say, how far is it from Cincinnati to Louisville, what's the most likely answer somebody's gonna give you? Two hours. It's about two hours. That's exactly right. And it's about two hours if you're doing what? It's about two hours if you're driving in a car. If you're taking a Greyhound, three or four. might be three or four, right? Um, if you're walking, it's a couple of days, right? Um, and if you're Bill Gates and you have a Learjet, it may be 30 minutes or something like that. So the faster you go, the shorter the distance becomes, even though that absolute distance hasn't changed. Uh, but another kind of distance is expense. How much does it cost you to get somewhere? Um, so for some of us, getting across town is really no concern at all. For other folks, just getting across town might be a debilitating expense. Um, and this is really, we're going to come back to this down here when we talk about economics, but moving things is expensive, and that plays into things. Another really important element here is risk. How risky is it to cross that distance? Are there things along the way, like, say, maybe the Atlantic Ocean, that want to kill you in between you and your destination, or need you cross through places where people don't like you for one reason or another. That all creates different kinds of risk. And another thing here that I was gonna work this in later, but now I wanna work it in now, it's also how familiar that place is to us. So our knowledge and familiarity of a distant point also defines how far away it is to us cognitively. Is it something that feels near to us or is it something that seems sort of unattainably far away? Uh, foreign even, if you would. All right, um, so distance also plays out in diversity. And I, I don't know if you can see this part of the PowerPoint out there in Zoom land or right here in the studio audience. This is something I love to hate. And these are stock images uh, that you find. If you go here, this one's from Getty Images, or if you go to ABC or 123 Images, these, these are the people that sell us all the images and maps and stuff that go in our textbooks. Um, and they love to represent maps like this. And what this map seeks to do is show how different all the different parts of the world are by highlighting different things in different places. In some places you have giant bald eagles, some places you have giant toucans, uh, some places you have brown people, and in some places you have people who are supposed to look Incan or something like that, or uh, people who are supposed to look kind of Eskimo over here, something like that, stressing the difference between people in different places. And indeed, there is ecological diversity and distance in the world. There is genetic distance in the world. 
uh, between different species and even within humans. And we're going to talk about that a fair bit in a couple of slides. Um, and there's also cultural distance, linguistic distance as well. Um, then we've got distance and economics. And so distance always plays into cost and value, but that relationship is complicated. Um, one of the most powerful ways distance has impacted human life and uh, uh, systems of exchange throughout time is that moving things very far made almost all things prohibitively expensive. Um, until the death of distance in the Industrial Revolution, it was basically pointless to move a bushel of wheat more than about 50 miles. Because if you moved it that far, it was now so expensive that nobody would ever buy it unless there was a famine or something like that. Um, so distance makes things more expensive, although at different levels, at different points, at different times, something we've learned just very recently, actually, as our entire global supply chain has kind of gotten out of whack. Things have gotten more expensive because, uh, we're gonna talk about containerization later too, uh, because our global supply of containers is all mucked up. Right now, we've got too many empty containers in one part of the world and not enough empty containers in another part of the world. Um, but the other thing is that sometimes certain things are worth more if they come from far away. So some of these things might be cloth. Silk is not only worth more because it's silk, and it's particularly nice, um, but it's also worth more because it's rare. It has to come from so far away that it is considered more valuable because it, it becomes a status symbol. Um, so sometimes distance increases cost, sometimes it increases value as well. Um, so next here is distance and power. And this is the fact that human beings figure out over time that controlling distance, that is controlling the mobility of other people, that is controlling other people's ability to challenge or cross distance is a great form of power. And that, for that, I have a battleship down here to, symbol, to symbolize the relationship of power and distance. Because what, what does a battleship what do you want a battleship for? One, sinking other people's battleships. <laughs> That's one way it works. But another way it works is battleships exist to control the movement of maritime commerce, right? Uh, battleships were created to stop other people from being able to move stuff around the world and whoever had the most and the biggest battleships were the people who could control the flow of goods and people around the world. Aircraft carriers now perform a similar kind of function as do air forces and missile systems and such as that. Uh, but to control this, I like this line, so I'm gonna read it right here. To control the relationship of others to distance is to enhance one's own power. Um, and finally, distance and privilege not everybody has the same relationship to distance. Um, some of us have a very privileged relationship to distance. I would probably fall into that pretty privileged relationship to di distance. I think I've crossed the Atlantic 18 times in my life, um, going either to Europe or West Africa. Um, some people haven't gotten out of the city they were born in for one reason or another. Um, but here's a, a point uh, I hope I'll come back to, but I'm a, in the course of thinking about distance, I have become absolutely convinced that every single one of us has our own unique map of the world that is just ours. That it is our sort of map of the possible world or map, it's again, it's our cognitive map of our awareness of the world. Uh, but we will come back to this as we will come back to everything uh, on this list. So next up, back to roughly 100,000 years ago. And we're going to talk about 
this beginning of the human relationship with distance, and I'm going to start out with what I hope is a fairly audacious assertion, and that is that human beings have a completely unique relationship with distance. Amongst all living things on the planet. And this is where it makes me sad to be talking to a mostly online audience, because this would be a really fun thing to talk about, so I'm going to privilege. See, it's back to privilege and distance. The people who are right in front of me are privileged here. Um, how might that be true or not true? What might make people unique in our relationship to distance? Yes, sir. We know about places that we've never been to. There you go. We have a social reproduction of knowledge that, again, lets us have a cognitive map. We may never have been to Mongolia, but we know Mongolia is there, and we might want to go to Mongolia for one reason or another, to see some very large and cool statues of Genghis Khan, for example. Uh, Can I that, argue on the other side? That yes, we please! Yes, we may not, in fact, know what other creatures know about this. Now, that's a very good point, and w there are certain things that have advantages over us. I'm going to say whales and elephants seem to cover enormous distances. They do cover lots of distance. And may have ways of communicating with each other about the things that they've seen. An excellent point. I would agree with that. But a whale can't decide to go other places. And they have to move in sort of certain patterns, right? You know, even um, monarch butterflies travel more than most human beings do, right? They, they migrate to central Mexico every year, but they have no choice but to migrate to central Mexico. And hummingbirds are going to cross you know, all this distance. They're migrating down to Mexico right now and such. Um, but human beings have the ability to choose where we go. So I think that's what makes us unique in distance. And we can decide to go under the ocean and swim around with whales. Um, but I'm going to make it, um, the argument I'm going to make here is that what makes human beings unique in our relationship to distance is culture. Um, now, this is my own definition of culture, which I came up with, r shameless plug, writing the world history textbook entitled World in Motion, coming out in 2023. Um, but uh, culture is one of those words, by the way, like civilization or kind of like distance or privilege that we use all the time, but we don't really exactly know what it means. So I've got my own operant definition of culture I'm using here. And I'm arguing that culture is the means by which human beings adapt to different environments and also adapt those environments to be more friendly to us. And what that allowed human beings to do was to become the very first truly global species. We started out right over here in East Africa, roughly 200 to 250,000 years ago with the origin of Homo sapiens sapiens in this region. But we did something that almost nothing had ever done before. The only thing that had ever done this was our ancestor, Homo erectus. We decided we were going to leave the place we were physically adapted to, all human beings, our tropical bipeds, um, originally. Um, and we decided that we were going to go everywhere in the world. Now, we didn't do it very fast. This initial conquest of distance takes, again, roughly 75,000 years, uh, where human beings get all the way from East Africa over here, all the way across uh, South uh, Western Eurasia, all the way to Eastern Eurasia, crossing from Sunda to Sahul, which is now Australia, about 50,000 years ago. So our first deep water ocean crossing takes place about 50,000 years ago. You go, Mungo man and Mungo woman, who are our oldest known uh, human uh, individuals um, from Australia. They date to about 55,000 years ago. Um, 
And then, very controversial, probably sometime between 30 and 15,000 years ago, we cross the Bering Sea and make it all the way down um, eventually into South America and also get across uh, the Pacific in the last like 5,000 years or so. That's truly astounding. And we do that because we can adapt ourselves to different climates. Um, we can do things like kill other things and wear their skins and live in places that are too darn cold for us to exist in otherwise. And by the way, a shout out doesn't have, it actually has a lot to do with distance. Probably the most significant technology that allowed human beings to conquer distance at this point was the needle, was the bone needle, which allowed you to tailor those animal skins to fit you tightly enough and closely enough to create what is basically a micro environment. It's a space suit for human explorers crossing the northern regions of our planet to get to these other places. Um, and by the way, that throws in one of the things we use to adapt to the world rather than uh, waiting for our bodies to physically adapt to cold climates or something like that, we use technology. So technology is one of the first expressions of human culture that allows us to move across these great spaces. So human beings are, I would argue, at least terrestrial. Yeah, okay, Marines could be different. Are blue whales everywhere? Are they in every ocean? Or do they just hang out in certain oceans? You see, I don't know. Must go look that up. <laughs> um, but we're the first global species, and I would point out this means we are also the first invasive species. Human beings are really only indigenous to over here. And we're an invasive species everywhere else we go. And you know, there's also uh, the great dying everywhere we go. We slaughter megafauna everywhere we go. So all the big mammoths and all the big sloths and such tend to die, and all the giant crocodiles and all the killer carnivorous kangaroos are dead within a few thousand years of human beings showing up in those parts of the world. Um, now, there are only a couple of other truly global species, and they are roaches and rats, but they cheat. Roaches and rats have spread to every single continent, including Antarctica, because there are roaches and rats at the International Research Station uh, in Antarctica. They have learned to piggyback on us. So they are critters that adapted as symbiotes to live with human beings, and they have hence gone global with us. Now, here's where something gets really fascinating. Um, and that is that because this migration is so slow, again, it takes 75,000 years for human beings to get from here to here and here. Um, it, one, human beings overcome distance and become this global species, but we also create distance when we do this. Because when people get all the way from here to here, for example, they are removed from one another by 60,000 years of time. And one, they have become genetically distinct from one another. This is what gives us the origin of what we will eventually decide to call race. Um, but it will also give us linguistic diversity, as human beings are physically separate from one another through innovation, our lingu languages become more and more different. And because we are adapting ourselves to different climates, learning to eat different things, learning to plant different crops, learning to deal with different kinds of environmental challenges, um, we become culturally distinct from one another as well. Um, and big shout out to David Northrup. Now, David Northrup is a, a fellow African historian of mine. He is also a world historian. He was president of the World History Association in, I think, 2005, 2006. And I had the privilege of hearing him 
offer up this argument, by the way, um, in Morocco, in, see, get the privilege, I just said I got to be in Morocco, oh, thank you College of Arts and Sciences, by the way, <laughs> for sending me to Morocco in 2005. Um, but he offered what absolutely has informed my teaching and thinking ever since, what is simply the most elegant periodization of world history I have ever come across. And he says that there are only two periods of human history. There's not an Iron Age, there's not a Bronze Age, there's not an Age of Discovery, there's not an Industrial Age. He's, he's fine, he says those exist too, but he says the most important are a period of divergence and a period of convergence. And he argues that up until about 1000 CE, so 99,000 years, human beings spread out and become more and more different from one another. We are separated genetically, so we're creating little genetic sub, whatever we call that, sub families or sub groups or whatever, different blood types and all the weird things that happen. Some of us have bigger noses than other people or whatever. Um, but, um, and we're coming up with all these new languages as we spread out and we're separated from each other. So we get to the point where probably, by the way, there are only two human-er languages. Uh, one is Khoisan, still spoken in Southern Africa. Uh, most people know it for the, being that funky language with all the pops and clicks. It has completely different phonemes that it sounds from any other language on the planet. Um, the other one we don't know, it's one of the other main African language families. Most people think it's Nilo-Saharan. Some people think um, it's Afro-Asiatic and linguists argue about it all the time. Uh, but every other language in the world is descended from that other African language. And so uh, take Yoruba spoken right, right here and Navajo spoken right here. They have more in common with each other than Yoruba and Khoisan have. But still, that's thousands, thousands of languages um, and thousands of different cultures and such. But then roughly a thousand years ago, Northrop argues, we begin to converge back together. And that's as people begin to shrink that distance, as people begin to move faster across greater spaces, we are reconnected and what we're seeing today is this period of incredible convergence where we are coming back together genetically, linguistically, and culturally. And I don't want to, huh, I'm so bad about getting off the subject. We lament the death of languages these days. And when you lose a language, you lose this entire body of knowledge and such. But there are today these sort of giant carnivorous languages. English is one, Mandarin Chinese is another, Arabic and Spanish are just devouring these little languages. But that's also an act of convergence. And it's bringing people into bigger and bigger spheres of interaction um, and reducing those linguistic and cultural and genetic divisions that intermittently defined us as a species. Is that fun stuff or what? David Northrup, ladies and gentlemen, what a smart guy. Okay, now I gotta go faster, <laughs> I need to go faster here. Okay, agriculture, cities, and distance. Now, one of the things that made it possible for human beings, I'm gonna back up real quick, one of the things that made it possible for early humans to move so far, so fast, was that all of those human beings were what we now call foragers. They, and what we used to call hunters and gatherers. Um, and those are people who have a very easygoing relationship with distance because they must move to survive. Uh, foragers have to range across a large area. They have to follow whatever animals they are hunting. There actually there's a certain incentive uh, to early humans to find animals that aren't familiar with us. Because if you think about it, a human being's not much of a threat to a mastodon. Uh, if you're a mastodon and you see this little hairless biped walking up, you're not going to be very scared, even if it has a stick with a rock on the end of it. Um, but after a while, you might learn to either stomp on the humans or run away from the humans. 
and the humans would be encouraged to go farther away from other humans and find some mastodons that haven't learned how to deal with humans yet. Um, so the necessary mobility of hunting and gathering encouraged people to move, but the rise of sedentary agriculture, which begins, by the way, everywhere in the world, it does not begin in the Fertile Crescent. No, that's one of the first places it happens, but it happens all over the world. I'm going to back up again, and here I am getting myself off the subject. Um, there are major what we call agricultural hearths in West Africa, Central Africa, East Africa, Australia is its own agricultural heart. Uh, the Andes and Mesoamerica are major centers. Uh, South Asia, what we call India here, Southeast Asia and Northeast Asia. These are all places where human beings invent agriculture totally on their own. They don't have to learn it from somebody on the Tigris or the Euphrates, for crying out loud. Um, but this innovation, which happens all over the world, allows people for the first time ever to stay put, which is a really remarkable innovation. And one of the things we do eventually, and this is beware time uh, compression, <laughs> that's where I'm going to leap over about 20,000 years here in 30 seconds, um, human beings eventually start building cities. And here's where I'm going to make another argument. The first cities begin to crop up about 8,000 BCE. Some of them are in that region of Mesopotamia, because that's one of the first places to get sedentary agriculture. But they're going to follow along in Southeast Asia and South Asia and Mesoamerica in short order by world history standards. 5,000 years, no time at all in world history. Um, and cities are weird. They are just giant bundles of contradictions. Um, one, cities are gross. Cities are full of all kinds of things that might kill you, like diseases. Cities are probably the petri dishes where almost all communicable human diseases are originally sort of developed and where we have to develop relationships with them. They're also full of strangers to whom you are not related. And that is a very weird way to live in terms of the grand sweep, <laughs> sweep of human history. Grand sweep of human history. Um, so, and by the way, cities until the late 19th century were incapable of reproducing themselves population-wise. Cities inevitably killed more people than people were capable to replace through natural human reproduction. So the only way to maintain cities until just about 150 years ago was to have constant migration into those cities to replace all the people who had died of typhoid or getting stabbed by somebody they didn't know. Um, but so why would you go to all that trouble to live in a big dirty place full of animal poop and people poop? Um, and it, the argument I'm going to make here is that cities, I'm going to do this, I'm going to try and go faster here. Um, cities are the first example of something we call time space compression. That is, a city creates an artificial environment with an artificial density of human intellectual capital, of human labor capital, and of resources. So you are capable of doing things in a city like tanning leather or manufacturing iron um, or processing uh, or making ceramics and such. You can do that at a scale in a city that you simply can't do anywhere else. And you do that by putting so many people so close together. You got to remember this is at a time when, amazingly enough, you couldn't go on YouTube and learn how to make a water jug, right? The only way to learn how to make a water jug was to be taught how to make that water jug. Um, and by being in a city, you could be around a whole bunch of people who knew how to make water jugs or something or whatever. Um, so their concentrations of human capital, as they shrink the distance between knowledge, sources of knowledge, which are only human beings at that time. Um, but cities also almost inevitably have something else, and that is walls. There are very few non-walled cities in early human history. 
So cities exist, one, to concentrate human capital in one place, but they also exist to create distance between the people in the city and their capital and the people outside of the city. Um, yet, those cities need those connections with the wider world because they need more people. Plus, they need food. Cities don't feed themselves. That's what villages do, by the way. That's the difference between a city and a village. A village feeds itself. A city does not. Um, they need water. They need materials. Um, and so cities are a great example of the early contradictions of distance as well, which resonate, I'll argue here in a little while, oh, I'm running out of time, um, even uh, with us to this very day. Ah, here we go, water. And here's where we get to really changing the human relationship with distance by people moving around faster. And water's a huge force in this. Uh, it's a complicated relationship between humans and water. We're going to start off with rivers. Uh, rivers are often in the way, and I have created myself a little river here using PowerPoint tools. <laughs> and so here's this river. It's going that way. Um, if, for example, you wanted to get from here to here, that river's in the way. It might be too fast or too deep for you to get across, especially if you're trying to move some things like livestock or moving some cloth or some pots or water-soluble spices or something like that. So that river creates a truly massive distance, and you may have to go a long way to get to a ford where you can wade across that river and get your stuff across safely. Eventually, what do human beings do? We build ferries, right, or boats that we can use to cross that point on the river. Or eventually, we build bridges. That takes thousands and thousands of years of rivers being in the way before we start building bridges across them. Um, but the other thing about rivers is, and I love this, they create a bizarre inverse relationship with distance. And if you think of this river, this river is flowing from your left to right, I think, whatever you are out there. Um, it's going that way. These are two fake little towns I've stuck on it with little black dots. To get from this town to this town is easy. It's like, by the way, getting from Cincinnati to Louisville in the early 19th century. You would build yourself a little barge, just a little flat bottom barge, and you would load up whatever you wanted to take to Louisville in it, and you would float down the Cincinnati, down the, down the, I'll get it, down the Ohio to Louisville. You would sell your stuff, then you would bust up your barge and sell it for firewood, and then you would walk back to Cincinnati because you cannot go this way up the river. It's a one-way trip. So closer here, farther here. Even worse, if you have some mountains in the way, mountains also create distance because they go up and down and to get across the mountains. You have to do this, or actually you have to do this. Go up and down the switchbacks, which is actually creating levelness by extending distance. I love that. Um, so, and this is my little forest that's in the way, but we won't go into that. But here, here's where we get to some of the really fun stuff. Maritime technology and the division of distance. Oceans start out in many ways as the ultimate dividers between human beings. Um, that, you know, somebody over here wasn't talking to somebody over here. This is South America, that's Africa, just in case it's blurry for you. Um, or somebody on the east coast of Africa wasn't talking to somebody um, in India or in the South China Sea or something like that. But over the course of the last millennium uh, BCE and the first millennium um, CE, a host of maritime technologies that I do not have time to talk about here, but many of which are contained in the Tao. The Tao is really the first modern sailing vessel. It's the first place all these global technologies come together and allow people to sail around in the Indian Ocean. And it's really by stealing all these technologies or borrowing them, depending on how you like to look at them, that the Portuguese and the Spanish and the Italians were able to eventually 
open the Atlantic. The Atlantic, by the way, is the last ocean in the world to be opened up, um, to, for, to become navigable for human beings. Um, and that is, by the way, because the Atlantic wants to kill you. Um, and if you look at this, this is totally serendipitous, by the way. Totally, I promise. Um, I took this picture. This, by the way, one of the coolest websites in the world, Null Space. Um, that is real-time map data for the entire world, also real-time ocean current data for the entire world. I lose hours every time I go to it. I snapped this picture of the Atlantic just for this presentation about two months ago. But do you notice that it looks evil? Two little scary eyes and a big old frown down here. Um, the Atlantic was basically impossible to sail across without a host of technologies, all of which you see here on the Dow, um, but with a really, really sturdy hull that comes uh, from the Portuguese bark thrown in. Um, so what happens when you get this kind of maritime technology? Um, first, again, in the Indian Ocean, the South China Sea. Uh, also, a big shout out for Austronesian seafarers. They're the first ones to really figure out how to do deep water navigation. Um, but these oceans suddenly shrink once human beings can cross them. Um, and this is what Alfred Crosby, uh, who's a, another world historian famous for his book, The Columbian Exchange, which is all about shrinking the ecological distance between different parts of the world. Um, but what he says is that these maritime innovations sewed shut the seams of Pangaea. That is, they effectively took all these separate continents and made them into one continent that was accessible from all these other Places. So ships utterly transform the nature of distance and allow the crossing of the Atlantic and the creation of what we now call an Atlantic world, which is added to the Indian Ocean world. In fact, what you get is a single world ocean as a result of all this. Every place in the world becomes connected to every other place in the world over the space of just a couple of hundred years, which is shocking. It's important to keep in mind, though, that even with all this beautiful sailing technology, by the way, Dow's are fast. Look at all that sail. I mean, if it looks to you like, you know, an America's Cup racing yacht, uh, that's because most of the technologies in an America's Cup racing yacht actually started out on Dallas in the Indian Ocean. Uh, but anyway, you have to go where the winds are going in a sailing ship with, with only a small amount of leeway. So you can't sail straight anywhere. You have to follow the winds to get places. And if you look at this right here, if you wanted to sail from England to Great Britain right here, anywhere this way, at this point, about two months ago, it's impossible. You can't get past. You might get up here and then get caught in this big northeaster and die. Um, but it, there were certain times you simply could not sail across the Atlantic. And again, this goes back to risk and, by the way, uncertainty in time. You just don't know how long it's going to take you to sail across an ocean. If you're super lucky in 1800, you might sail across the Atlantic in three weeks. But it might take you six to eight weeks, and you might die. Uh, especially since there was no weather forecasting which is invented in Cincinnati. Don't have time to talk about that. Um, but so you didn't know if there was a hurricane out there. You just had to sail out and see what happened. All right, so anyway, ah, death of distance. And by the way, Mark Nykirk said I could talk to 715 if I absolutely had to. <laughs> I, I think I might have to. Uh, but anyway, so here it is, the death of distance. This, I love the concept. Uh, the person who per first used this term overtly, is, is an economist, Francis Cairncross, who used it in an article in The Economist in 1996, um, talking about how the internet was co flattening the earth, as Thomas Friedman would say. It was completely destroying distance that you could now, rather than sending a letter and having to wait for it to get two weeks to get somewhere and two weeks for it to come back, you could send an email and that you could maybe someday we'll send video. Um, and as soon as, and then Karen Cross got so much traction from that article, she wrote a book, there's the book. It was a bestseller. And a bunch of historians said, 
Hey. Distance didn't die in the late 1990s. Human beings have been at war with distance our entire existence. And so there's now, it's, we, we argue when distance died. Um, but really, the truth is, it's, it's been dying for a long time, all the way back to those bone needles, maybe. Um, but certainly one of the big turning points, and the one, uh, the one I'll talk about because I'm running out of time, it's the Industrial Revolution. And what the Industrial Revolution does is it gives us the ability to cross oceans and land at speeds we had never before imagined possible. And this is all because initially of steam. Now, steam power uh, is one. We're harnessing a new form of energy rather than harnessing the wind and letting it push us roughly in the direction it's going. Um, we are using chemical energy. We are using energy that is bound up in coal first. Later on, we're going to use oil. Uh, but, and we're using that to make stuff move. And uh, I'd love to talk about this more. We make things rotate in particular, which is a particularly useful form of motion. Um, but this, and eventually as steam engines get smaller, the first steam engines are roughly the size of a house, and they make about five horsepower, and they consume tons of coal per hour. That's no good for crossing oceans. Um, but as they get smaller, more powerful, and more efficient, you can put them on stuff and have them move themselves. And that first happens with steam ships, and then eventually we put them on rails and we let them move themselves across the land. And to give you a sense of this, um, again, crossing the Atlantic by the early 19th century, even the clipper ships, which were considered to be you know, the fastest sailing ships in the world, again, you were looking at weeks to cross the Atlantic. The very first steamship to successfully cross the Atlantic, and I'll back up here again to show you just how the Atlantic wants to kill you, uh, goes from Cork in Ireland to New York City in 1938. And that ship is the Sirius. And it crosses the Atlantic in 18 days. It cuts the best possible time by roughly a third. It is followed one day later by the Great Northern, which does it in 15 days. By the late 1800s, they were routinely crossing in 10 days. The last ship to set a record for this was the United States, Merca. In 1952, it crossed the Atlantic in three days and 12 hours, beating the Queen Elizabeth II by six hours. Uh, but what that meant was you could go straight, you could ignore those storms, you could go right through them, you might even try and sail past a bunch of icebergs, although we don't recommend that. The Titanic was, by the way, trying to set a new Atlantic speed crossing record to brag about. That's why it kept going so fast in the middle of a field of icebergs. Uh, but what this meant is that if you think about it, if it takes three days to cross the Atlantic instead of, say, 40 days, the Atlantic is effectively one twelfth as wide. And you can now move people and goods across the Atlantic far more cheaply than you ever could before. Even more significantly, in some ways, our steam locomotives. Moving stuff across land has always been way more expensive than moving stuff on water. And trains completely obliterated that maritime waterborne advantage of moving stuff. Um, trains effectively reduced the cost of moving things in the United States by way of canals by 95%. It cost 1 20th as much to move stuff on trains in the late 19th century as it did to move things through canal systems, for example. And then, of course, you've got aircraft, and then you've got containerization. And down here at the bottom, what do we have? It's the Maersk Triple E, 
which is now the world's second largest container ship. I think it's capable of carrying 20,000 individual containers. Um, and containerization completely transforms moving stuff around the world. Uh, there's a reason, for example, why we don't make soap on the west side of Cincinnati anymore. It used to be, once upon a time, that every city had a soap factory because it was pointless to try and move that soap more than about 50 miles or 100 miles because the soap was too expensive. Containerization effectively makes it free to move things anywhere in the world. Um, right now, we're crying and moaning that the cost of a, a, a single container unit is $20,000 instead of $1,000 like it was before the pandemic. Even $20,000 to move a container of stuff across the Pacific Ocean is dirt cheap. Um, so containerization is why it's cheaper to manufacture stuff in Peru or Kenya and ship it to the United States than it is to make it in the United States. And it completely transforms the global economy. And by the way, container ships were invented by an American. So we did that to ourselves. <laughs> All right, so here's where, oh, I am moving into the wrap it up. I might be done by 710. I might manage that. Stick with me out there, folks. Um, so here's now where we get to the real meat of this. Distance, wealth, power, and privilege. And here's where I want to complicate that whole triumphant story of the death of distance. Now, by the way, I'm a technology geek. Uh, I love cars. I love big steam engines. I, I love seeing fighter jets fly straight up, even if I don't really like bombing people or anything like that. Um, but uh, just the power harnessed by technology. Big cranes. I totally love big cranes. Pick something heavy up for me, <laughs> please. Um, but it's a triumphant sort of story that's like, ah, we've destroyed distance. It's a lot more complicated for that because distance has not died for everybody. Um, if you're rich enough and if you're lucky enough, if you're privileged enough, and we'll get back to that, it's incredibly easy to move around the world. You can go on vacation in Cancun, right? People go to, people go to Cancun for spring break, right? Um, but people in Mexico, the vast majority of the Mexican population, are not allowed to come to the United States. And that's a matter of privilege, right? Um, so there's also an issue that sometimes you're forced to move and poverty can force you to move. Uh, environmental change, global warming can force you to move. If, you're, if people out there have been following the, what's called the migrant crisis in Europe, I and many other world historians would argue that that is largely a climate driven crisis. Um, the growth of the Sahara Desert and increased desertification in Southwest Asia and in what we call the Middle East is pushing populations out of those regions. And those people are trying to find a place that isn't turning into a desert. And that means crossing the Mediterranean and getting to Europe, for example. Um, a much more local example of this is gentrification. The rich people might show up and decide your neighborhood is a great investment, and then you'll be forced to move out. Um, but getting more to the point here is that at the very same time that all that technology that's so exciting that I was just talking about that steamships and trains made it way more easy for people to move immense distances very quickly, we started inventing new social technologies that sought to regulate distance. First and foremost among these, by the way, is the nation itself. I would argue that the nation is invented to stop people who you don't want to move from moving around. 
Um, prior to the 19th century, there was no such thing as a border and a border crossing. There was no such thing as a passport. Passports didn't really come into being until the early 20th century following World War I. Um, so borders are a form of distance. They are, in fact, usually an invisible wall. Sometimes they're a physical wall. Um, but they don't affect everyone equally. Um, and a key for this, by the way, is what passport have you got? Because not all passports are created equal. Uh, there is a concept known as passport power. Um, and some passports let you go more places in the world more easily than other passports. I'm going to privilege the close up studio audience again. Anybody want to try and guess the most powerful passport in the world right now, or one of the most powerful passports in the world right now? Japan, Japan a history professor for the wind. <laughs> Thank you, but Dr. Switzerland. Switzerland. Switzerland's close. I think they're in the third tier right now. Um, it's Singapore and Japan are currently the top. It's, it's actually an interesting mix of sort of power and economic influence and not having pissed too many people off. I, if I had more time, I'd tell you my own story about trying to drive across the Sahara Desert in 1994. Um, the short version of that is I tried to drive across the Sahara Desert in 1994 and I didn't make it. Um, I, was driving, I was traveling with two Dutch guys and what stopped me was the border in Algeria because the Algerians would not let me in. Uh, but the Algerians were like, welcome Dutch people. American, go away. Uh, and so they're, they're semi-permeable moon brains. Not everybody gets across. Um, but it's not only different passports. By the way, I, I got a cheat sheet here. Right now, this shifts every week. Right now, Japanese can get into 193 countries in the world without even a visa. Um, Singaporeans can get into 192. The US citizens can get into 186 countries. We're tied in the seventh tier. Russians can only get into 119 countries. Nigerians, my second home, can only get to 45 countries in the world, almost all of which are other African countries. And at the bottom of the passport power ranking is Afghanistan, and Afghani passport will only get you into 26 countries in the world without a visa. But most people say, well, so what? Get a visa. Now again, privilege-wise, if I want a visa to Nigeria, I can go online to the Nigerian embassy in New York, not in New York City, in Washington, D.C., and I can fill out my visa application. I can pay $300. If I want express service, I can pay $500. And I can have, and I can express my passport to them and back. More speed, right? Um, and I can have my visa to Nigeria within five days. And I can, I already bought my ticket, so if I wanted to get to Nigeria, I could be to Nigeria in six days from now. For a Nigerian, one, you have to get a passport, which is a lot harder in Nigeria. It typically takes two to three years to get your passport, and you have to travel physically to the nation's capital. That's quite common, by the way, in, around the world. And even once they have their passport, if they want to come to the United States, what they must do is go online and say, I want a visa interview with a US consular officer at the embassy or consulate. There are only two places in Nigeria where you can do that, one in Abuja, one in Lagos. And here is my $150, which is about 15% of the Nigerian per capita income for a year, um, which is non-refundable, even if I don't get my visa. And then they will give you a date for your visa interview, which is typically nine to 12 months away. So you must wait nine to 12 months for your interview. And by the way, your chances of getting that visa to the United States are about 2%. So my distance from Nigeria is about six days. 
but for members of my, my Nigerian family, the distance from the United States is anywhere from three or four months to 15 years. Because I still have some members of my Nigerian family who've been trying to come to the United States for 15 years, and they haven't gotten here yet. Um, so that's a great example of that. So, hey, there's the BAFO conclusion. I, I did, uh, I'm going to make it in by 710. I'm gonna do, there are people over here, by the way. You can't see them, but they're cool people, and they're, <laughs> they're doing tech stuff. And we, we couldn't do it without them. Everybody, give it up. <laughs> tech people. Yeah, yeah, all the cool tech people. Okay, so here's the BAFO conclusion and a few examples of some things from this. Um, humans have spent thousands of years using culture and technology to challenge distance. But about the same time that we figured out how to defeat distance, we've really figured out how to defeat distance. We can get from just about anywhere to just about anywhere in a matter of hours. Um, we have also started to create new political, economic, and cultural borders in order to create distance so as to control certain other people. Um, and for, I got two examples here I want to point out. These are roughly coterminous. Um, this is an anti-immigration uh, ad from a, a US magazine from the 1890s. This is an ad for the Great White Fleet, the United Fruit Company's cruise line in the Caribbean. This is from about 1920 or something right in here. So they're close-ish together. Um, here, we have Uncle Sam holding his nose, repulsed by, quote, the stranger at our gate. And this is a Jewish would-be immigrant to the United States. And what he holds here is he holds a bag that says poverty. He holds another bag that says disease, um, one that says anarchy, and finally, something that says Sabbath desecration on his back. And notice that Uncle Sam is standing at a wall, but he's lamenting, I have to let you in because there's no law to keep you out. But we fixed that in the early 20th century and passed laws to keep people out and started requiring things like passports and visas and birth certificates to get into the United States. And even though most people in the world didn't have birth certificates in the late 1890s or early 20th century. The counterpoint to this is 23 days all expense cruises calling at, what does it say here, calling at Jamaica, Panama, and Cuba, Jamaica, Panama and Costa Rica, and what it says, every passenger, a guest of the company during the cruise, going in the footsteps of the conquistadors. So going on tour to Jamaica or Cuba on the Great White Fleet, not very subtle, <laughs> was following in the path of those who had conquered those lands for Europeans, and I want to back up here just for Dr. Loire. Travel luxuriously on imperial airways. Europe, Africa, India, and the Far East. And imperial airways was for who? The, the Europeans. The Europeans, <laughs> that's right, uh, because what happens is the world comes very close to Europe, but Europe remains very far from the rest of the world. And that's the system we put in place. By the way, there's a chapter on that in the textbook, not in the textbook, in the book, um, which is entitled The Colonization of Distance. Um, so finally, for every one of us, once again, repeating myself, there exists a unique map of the world. That map is largely a result of each individual's luck of origin, wealth, and privilege, but it is also a result of our knowledge and fear. And since I know Diana McGill is out there <laughs> watching this remotely, let me also say that 
one of the best ways to reduce distance between our student community and the rest of the world is through very strong foundations in general education in the humanities and also through study abroad programs, which deserve ever more investment. But at that point, I'll wrap up. And we need to hire more history professors. But that's, yeah. <laughs> and now I look forward to your questions. Do we have questions? We have two from online. Hot diggity. Let's, let's privilege the online people right. this time. So at least the first one, how do city planners, futurists, Ooh. politicians, and that kind of folk use your research, your thinking, your philosophy on distance? They don't yet. <laughs> <laughs> how would I want them to? Um, that's, now, I, I'll say I'm not the only person doing this. I am, as far as I can tell, the only person who is synthesizing the entire sort of history of humanity into a single study of distance. I think that's what we historians uh, have the opportunity to bring to this game. Uh, there's some really great research, by the way, uh, from the 1990s um, from British Marxist geographers. And I'm blanking on the name of the geographer um, who came up with this, but he comes up with the concept of what he calls the soft city, um, where he stresses that cities, modern cities are malleable. Um, they are not fixed entities. Um, and so if you think about cities as being concentrations of human capital that also must have ties, to the wider world, um, I think that that sort of brings into, again, and in fact, that's where I'm going to go to answer this question. What, uh, what I would want people to do is see the contradictions inherent in cities. Um, and in fact, I would say, take this one step farther, um, I'm hoping to do an op-ed on this sometime soon, is that there's an inherent tension between cities and nations. Um, nations are created, have been created to sort of keep the rest of the world at bay. You know, you're supposed to have a national identity, which actually, interestingly, comes often from the capital city. That becomes where the, the nation's culture is, is. It's Paris or it's London or it's New York uh, or Lagos or something like that. That's where the, the nation is created. Um, but... The city also has such a strong identity of its own, and because a city must have international uh, connections, cities are by nature cosmopolitan. So they resist that sort of single identity that comes from the nation. So I would say recognizing that nations, uh, cities are this uh, contradiction and that there's a tension between cities and nations would be the, what planners and those folks should keep in, uh, keep in mind. I hope that worked. Oh, yes. That one. So you, know, you talked about um, in the 1990s when the internet got widely ah. deployed um, and people start talking about the death of distance. Hmm. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking actually about the, the present moment when because of the <sighs> pandemic and Zoom, oh, yeah. we, we suddenly have, you know, I think a great leap forward in that death of distance because people are actually not even wanting to leave their houses anymore. Yeah, right? so the internet well, didn't do that for a long time, but now it's really doing that. Yeah, uh, well, again, I think there's co there are contradictions in that. Yeah. Um, in, the, in fact, I was thinking about this while walking here tonight, uh, right along these lines, is that the pandemic kind of turned our normal political positions on distance on their head. Um, where, because one of the things that the pandemic resulted in was governments imposing distance, right? Six foot social distancing or lockdowns or curfews. Um, and the people who had been most in favor of controlling the movement of human beings before controlling our borders and such were like, no, you can't tell me <laughs> that I can't go to a bar. Well, you can tell other humans they can't come into the country, but you can't tell me I can't go to a bar. And other people, right, people like me, <laughs> who had been saying, people should always be free to move around. And I was like, you better stay in your house, man. <laughs> Everybody needs to go online for the good of us all. Um, but yeah, but it, the pandemic created distance. I mean, astounding 
distance between us as individuals, but we did turn to other things to sort of find different kinds of connection. Uh, I found them to be deeply unsatisfying myself. I found Zooming with my mom deeply unsatisfying as opposed to visiting her, for example. Better than nothing, um, but again, contradictions. Yes. I'm just following up on that. I would say that that's like that was an acceleration of those trends. Because if you think about people's mm -hmm. behaviors, like we started having streaming services and the movie industry was dying, and that was pre pandemic. Oh, yeah. So we're yeah. already talking about people ordering in, ordering things, not going to stores. These were already oh, yeah. things that were just, I think, accelerated under the pandemic. But these were trends that were already taking place without the pandemic. Exactly. And you're right that they put into law. Different things in it, but it was, you know, in my view, an acceleration of a, a yeah, it's trend. yeah, and you know, part of this I hadn't thought about this before, and that's why talks like this are good for me, um, is that you know, distance affects human beings, and distance affects stuff, right? right? Um, stuff that human beings want, but we so accelerated the movement of stuff during the pandemic, you know, like having food deliveries and or getting everything from uh, Amazon. And I completely shifted um, to ordering all my groceries online, which I still do now, even though I'm all vaxxed and I will go into stores. Um, but it really sort of put the kibosh on so much international movement. You know, conferences, you know, were canceled and such. You are signaling me. No? No, I wasn't. Oh, I thought you were. Uh, do we, we do have another online question, though, we don't we? We have three. Oh, hot diggity. <laughs> uh, are we still in the time of convergence? And how does, that, how, does, how does the impending climate crisis play a role in that? That is a fabulous question, Zoom person. Um, Angela. Angela, thank you, Angela. I would say, yes, we are still in a time of convergence. In fact, that convergence is accelerating. And in part, it's accelerating through this kind of media. Uh, if you think about the, the fact, you know, that America, our students, I'll be the old guy here, you know, our students are anime fans or K-pop fans, right? Or that, let's face it, Northern Kentucky University has a sushi bar. That's astounding. My grandfather thought Chinese food was an act of sedition. <laughs> right? Really? Um, and, and so the cultural convergence is astounding. You know, people watch Chinese movies, people watch Bollywood movies, people watch Nollywood movies. Everybody in the world eats Kentucky Fried Chicken. I mean, it's astounding. In fact, I'm kind of a believer, like, every primate city has become the same place. You know, what, London and uh, Paris are really kind of the same place now. They, they got the same shops and, you know, in Beijing and Abuja, Nigeria and, you know, Kuwait City. They're all kind of the same place. Um, and, you know, I'm a great example myself. You know, uh, I'm a southern white boy, but I wound up, you know, my distance with the world was shrunk through my college education. And I decided to become an African historian because I took African history classes. Um, and I wound up marrying a Nigerian woman who I met in North Carolina because she had won the visa lottery. I mean, that's incredible, you know, cultural and genetic convergence right there. Uh, what was the second part of that question, though? Uh, uh, does the climate crisis ah, play a role? Yes, and I would say absolutely. That's a, that's a great insight. And again, when I only briefly touched upon the, the fact that the environment is itself moving across distances. It's not supposed to move across right now because of, I would say, human-induced climate change. Uh, you could disagree. Um, but the migrant crises we are seeing now are radically accelerating that level of convergence. Um, and again, when you talk about, you know, Syrian refugees in Germany or um, Somali refugees in Maine. That's where most Somali refugees have gone in the United States, is to Lewiston, Maine. Talk about convergence, right? Um, and again, the, this operates on so many levels. European colonialism was part of convergence as well, because Europeans went to all these parts of the world and converged with people genetically and culturally and linguistically as well. But climate change is definitely accelerating things. Anybody who thinks that the current migration crisis 
uh, as we call it, in the United States or in Europe or in Southeast Asia, for that matter, um, thinks that that isn't driven by climate, I would just say, you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so following yes. up on that, so do you see the changing distance affecting the generation growing up now? Who? Yes. Um, and uh, without a doubt, again, the, the sort of the globalization of pop culture, for example, uh, oh, there used to be this great thing. I, I, I just totally forgot about it. I think the pandemic killed it for me. I used to use it in class all the time, but it was a website which would tell you the current number one song in every country in the world. So you could click on Kazakhstan and see what you know the, the most popular song in Kazakhstan was. And it was almost inevitably like Kanye West or something like that. I, I mean, the mere, the mere power of hip hop in African American culture. Uh, in, in global pop culture is just an incredible example of convergence. Uh, but you know, I'll give it another family example here. My older boy um, is a programmer and a gamer, and his best friends, who he won't tell me the names of, are Pakistani and Peruvian, and they live in Pakistan and Peru. And he hangs out with them online for hours every day. And that's his, those are his relationships. And that's made power, made possible by those internet connections. And he chats with them incessantly, and they send each other videos, and they're giggling all the time, and they're writing video games. That's, you know, Japanese video games originally, they're Mario people. Yeah. It sounds like you're optimistic about this. Are you optimistic about these distance convergences? <laughs> wow, now that's a, that way to put me on the spot person <laughs> out there. Um, you know, it's a tough call. I, I want to come back to the fact that convergence is destructive. Uh, I think that's a really important point to keep in mind here. The destruction of languages, and that's what it's inevitable, right, um, is, is destructive. And, you know, what happens when everybody eats Kentucky Fried Chicken and, and McDonald's and prefab sushi um, all the time. What do we lose? You know, we lose local cuisines um, and flavors and things like that. Um, but, you know, once something's kind of inevitable, I like to kind of embrace it. And so I, I do, and I'm a great example of convergence too. I'm a middle-class Southern white boy who decided to become an African historian. I mean, uh, and that's privilege too. You're privileged when you get to make that choice. Um, but, um, in the long run, more human beings having more in common with each other and being more able to interact and discuss and see each other's perspectives, I think that's good in the long run. Does it mean it's incredibly painful in the process in no small part because there are so many people who are pessimistic about it, who are trying to create those borders? Um, yes, it, it's going to be painful for the next many decades, if not centuries. I think this kind of plays into that. But, um, one last one here. Mm -hmm. And it's about nations and political ah, structures. Ooh, one of my favorite things. So it says nations are ethical, or excuse me, ethnic and cultural. Ha! States are, are purely political structures whose walls, boundaries, borders can shift. So as humanity is converging, Nations are disappearing as humans become mixed identities. Does the idea of mixed ethnic identities and the idea of reducing distance? Yes. By the way, did you see my thoughtful face here? <laughs> um, I, I'd start being an academic at the very beginning saying that nations are ethnic and cultural creations. That's a fiction in my mind, that na nations are fictions that then seek to create that which they pretend that they are based on. Um, nations seek to create this homogenized national culture that didn't really exist before. And they do that by destroying those regional identities and such. Um, but uh, what was the last part of that again? But do, do I see this multi-ethnic kind of mixed identity 
having a positive, having a Yes, severity. again, I would say it's a, that means that we will have more grounds with, with which to be able to interact with each other. We won't have those linguistic barriers. Hopefully we won't have those barriers of I'm American and you're Pakistani and we won't ever get along. We're different. I think those notions of difference are largely created. As a, as a world historian, I think human beings have far more that bring us together than actually separate us. But there's a lot of political hay to be made from stressing those differences and saying they are insurmountable. Well, thank you very much. Um, our audience here, our audience online, if we can give you thank a you. real and virtual round of applause. <laughs> thank you all for joining me and listening to me and asking such great questions. And we used every bit of our time, which my students know I always do. <laughs> Thanks for coming. <laughs>